So I'm going to open up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this word. We thank you for the message. We thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit speaks and we hear it and are watered. We thank you, Lord, that your word is true and trustworthy and faithful, Lord, and that we can go back to it time and time again. And it doesn't change. You are the same God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. And you are the same God today as you were then. And we can just lean upon those promises. And we're going to talk about those tonight, Lord. And we just ask that you would light in our hearts and minds, Lord Jesus, everything that we need to hear tonight. And we just give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, ladies. So we're wrapping up the last of who am I and what am I doing here. It's been quite the journey. We've learned about human nature who we are as human beings, that we're chosen by God, that his pleasure and his fellowship are what we're made for. We are redeemed and adopted. We're given access and privileges. We're the daughter of the King of Kings, and we were even given gifts of the Holy Spirit. God's presence, with God's presence, we can go on assignment. And God's assignment is to love the unlovable, to bring back the lost, and to go forth and shine his light into the darkness so that all may come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that all summed up everything of who I am and what am I doing here. So what is lesson seven? Well, lesson seven, as we practice these declarations and we learn God's promises, we have to be reminded that not only is God with me, he's in me. And that means that he doesn't leave us that he doesn't forsake us, and that we can stand on those promises. So even when we don't hear or feel what God is saying, we can trust in his word. And tonight, we're going to um, talk a little bit about what happens when we feel like God is quiet or distant. We're not really feeling on fire I don't know if you've ever felt like you just prayed and prayed and these prayers feel like they're bouncing off the ceiling. Or there's radio silence. You're still waiting and waiting. Or you think because of all the circumstances in front of you, like this thing happened, and then this thing happened, and then, oh my gosh, again, then this thing happened. God must not love me. God must not be here. He's not hearing me. You know, those are real crises. We... There's real grief, and there is real sorrow. We do have real feelings. You know, sometimes offense and anger takes us over, and we can release that forgiveness, those feelings, and we go, but God, why do I still feel this way? I had let it go. I had given it up. I have turned it over, but I still feel this anger. I still feel this way. You know, life just sometimes sucks. It really does. It's hard, and... Um, We have to deal with those feelings. And as believers, we have to understand that God does understand where we're at. He does see our circumstances. We have to make a conscious choice, though, not to believe those feelings, but to put our trust in God. To put your gaze upon him and then take a time out in order to realign your thinking, your thought process, to get back to that intimacy with God. And then there's real steps that we can actually take. We talked about a little bit in our lesson of like real things we can do to get back to being closer to God, pressing in, some steps that we can do on a daily basis, some steps we can do in the the stop gaps or the, the funk periods as I call them. You're made of heart, mind, body, soul, and spirit. The soulish part of our existence is our intellect, our emotion, or our will. And it's where we make decisions. Sometimes it's based on feeling. Sometimes we make decisions based on circumstances, what I see right in front of me. And sometimes it's based on feelings. I really just don't want to do that. (laughs) But we're also made up of spirit. And that spirit functions different than our mind. The spirit is the part that becomes born again. It's the way we commune with God for he's spirit and Our spirit talks to spirit. And it's through our intuition and our communion with God and our conscience that is where God can transform not just to be with you, but to be in you. 
And that's where the spirit is really important. It's important to understand that so you can go back to what is the truth? And then not, those are my feelings and I can differentiate between my heart and my mind and what does God say? So our soul needs to be constantly renewed. That's the thing that gets run down. And that renewing happens when we intentionally make choices to believe or act accordingly to what God says. We learn to live differently as mature Christians through faith of who God is, who he says we are, and then above all of that, that he loves us and that he chose us. It's believing in his promises and, the char- and God's character, who he is, and trusting that Romans 8, 28, we know all things work out for the good, to work together for the good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. We're talking about making conscious decisions of walking by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians. Choosing faith over feelings, it, it, it sounds simple, but we've heard it many times. You know, and I think this is one battle that I personally deal with on a daily basis, especially when I'm caught off guard by something, I wasn't expecting something, something happens, and my first instinct is fear, panic, anxiety, stress, I'll just hold it in, you know, and maybe I might get a little grumpy and angry too. <laughs> but um, if I don't catch it and seize it and renew my mind in God's word, I let my feelings lead my whole day. The soulish part takes over, and then rather being led by the Holy Spirit, I'm being led by my emotions, my stress, my anxiety, and I put my reality into that. You know, so each day I wake up, and I pick up my now 10-year new appendage, which is my phone. Everybody has their phone. They pick it up first thing. And I look at the little number on my phone, and it says emails. Oh, my goodness. I have 450 new emails overnight. How did that happen? (laughs) Click. Oh, I go to the starred ones first. Oh, the urgent ones first. Hey, Kate, um, I really need this by 9 a.m. Hey, can you look back, uh, you know, two years ago when we had that conversation, can you find that email? Oh, by the way, you know uh, that deadline that we had that was next week? Can I have that today? (laughs) My heart's beating already. Hey, man, it's 6 in the morning. (laughs) And I've already looked at 450, most of it spam emails, but, you know. And then I go, click, okay, reset. And then I notice there's a text. I got four text messages too. Oh my goodness, click on that. Wait a minute. There are four text messages from my husband, Scott, who's still sleeping. Because he sent them the night before saying, hey, don't forget to take the dog here. Don't forget to pick up this. Hey, don't forget about asking Casey or your son or this or that about this. And now I've gone to the 10th level. And it's all before 6.30 in the morning. And I'm kind of already started my day with anxiety, stress, and this little appendage here that I have. So I have to choose to put it down and say, okay, Lord, I'm not going to be overwhelmed. Hold on, take me away. I'm just showing my age, but... Anyway, um, (laughs) but instead, you know, of going to my lovely, organized husband, I go to God. God is my provider. He's the one that's going to renew my mind. He's the one that is going to make sure that I have peace. So this spooling up that I just started, he's going to go, Kate, I got this. Kate, don't worry about it. Look up, look and gaze up at me, not at the circumstances. You know what, all of those to-do lists are very real. You still have to do them. But God helps me when I go to him in the morning and I say, Lord, please give me, what does your word say today? I need that peace. What are the priorities, Lord, that we need to do today? I ask him, be in my day. I know you're with me, but I need you to be in me so that I can have that peace when I go to those meetings, when I have that conversation, when I take the dog, then I can lift him up. All of that, I need, I need, I need God. And if I don't do it, I can tell right away. 
because I'm being led all day by my day, by my feelings, and by what my circumstances are. So I have to be choose to be present with God. I have to choose to include him in my everyday everything. No matter how I'm feeling, sometimes I really just don't want to. But you know what? God says, you know, I will make a way when you don't even see the way. He says, glance at the problems. Just glance at them, but gaze at me. And the secret to living life victoriously is this exact same thing is you glance at the problem, but keep your gaze on him. He's the one that's going to bring us through. There was this wonderful retreat leader that um, said this, and her name is Bonnie Thomas. I'll never forget. She was just, ever meet one of those people that you just, just the peace, they're just so peaceful. But it was because she said, keep your gaze on God and just glance at the circumstances. And you're going to find the peace. You're going to find the way. And if you just put your whole trust in God, He's going to make the way, and then you're going to recognize it as you walk with him. But our human tendency is to do the opposite. <laughs> we gaze at the problems for a prolonged time. We listen to people rehashing them out with us. Oh, I want to talk it out. Counselors, friends, spouses, everybody telling us what to do. Oh, you need to do this. Oh, you need to do that. And we get so wound up in, again, looking at the circumstance but we need to go back to what did God say this morning? What was your priority? God said, I'm going to make a way when you don't see a way. Don't get spooled up. But this is how we walk by faith instead of by what we see in the natural realm. We see this in the Bible, and I think this is such a great example, and I want to share this with you because the Apostle Paul I, to put this in pers- our own perspective, I just told you about my emails and everything, but the Apostle Paul went through more in three days than I probably went through in my lifetime. If you just look at what he went through with Silas, just in that short period of time, he had a vision, and the Lord said, don't go to Asia, go to Macedonia, and the guy always going, oh, I'm over here, come here. So Paul's like, okay, we're going to go over here, and he gets there, and he doesn't meet the guy from Macedonia, he meets a lady named Lydia. Lydia was a businesswoman, and she becomes the first convert. But did that stop Paul? No, he made a home church, and he started off with her. And then he started preaching in the town. And then there was a demon-possessed girl, and she just kept going, following them around. And Paul and Silas, everywhere they would go, they would go to say the, the good word. And she would go, these are the servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. And then they would go over here, and, they, and she would say, These are the servants of the Most High God who are telling you to be saved. And after a while, I'm sure Paul was like, really, really, I have to deal with this? So then he finally says, okay, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And it does, in Jesus' name. And she's delivered. And there's praises. But no, it doesn't stop there. He then gets accused of rousing up the whole city, gets lied about, Paul and him get flogged and beaten and thrown into jail. And not just any jail, they're thrown into the inner sanctum of jail, which is like shackles and this. And now again, remember, this is all like, Lord, I went to Macedonia, I met the lady, I did this, I had delivered the other lady, and now I'm in jail. I mean, most of us would be like, forget it. This is the end. Really? All of that in this time period. But what did they do instead? Right. We see it in Acts 16 is where it is. I mean, can you put yourself in Paul and Silas' shoes? They must have had tremendous physical pain. They've been lied about. They've been publicly humiliated, beaten, and all for doing good for the Lord. So do you think you would have been able to last that long? think I would. But this is a good example because then it says here, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them and suddenly there was a violent earthquake and the foundations of the prison were shaken at once. All the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains became loose. And the jailer 
woke up and said, when he saw the doors open, he drew his sword about to kill himself because he thought, oh, the prisoners have escaped. But look what it says here. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are here. So first of all, we open this up and say Paul and Silas were singing and praising. They were singing and praising even when they were in prison. And then God delivers him. He has this earthquake and the chains fall off and, you know, it's like home free. We could have, they could have bailed. They could have gone to Lydia's house. They could have been out of there. But that agape love, that understanding and trusting in God, they stopped and they knew they had to stop the jailer from killing himself. So they stopped. They didn't choose to go out and free them. They knew that this jailer would harm himself if they didn't, if he, they didn't stay. So they chose to trust God. They chose to stay. And you know what? God did an amazing thing. He delivered the jailer. He saved them. And then they took him home and his whole family was baptized. Amen. That's so God, right? But God can do that. So how much more when we look at this story of Paul and Silas that God was willing to do for you, you know? These little things, these little deliverance things, we're not in chains, we're not in bondage, literally, but God wants freedom for you. And that freedom comes from trusting in his word, believing in his promises, going back to the word and listening and reading stories like Paul and Silas that can be encouraging to us to, that our circumstances are this little big, but our God is that big. We can trust in him. Our deepest level of worship is actually praising God during the trials. Did you know that? Yeah. He wants to know that you trust him, that you are there no matter what. And despite our pain, that we are trusting in him, even when he seems distant and you can't feel your, his love or you think you can't feel it because, it, again, it's a feeling, he wants you to go back to say, but do you trust me? I love you. Do you trust me? Can you choose that? You know, we mess up when we live by our feelings instead of faith. Um, so we have to ask God to help us mature in that. And God will allow testing times. Sometimes it's for our own character or our benefit or things that he wants us to push through to the next level. So he'll just be a little quiet until you reach out to him. And he wants you to pursue him. And he wants you to say, hey, what's up, God? I know this is going on. And then he is so happy saying, hey, I'm glad you had the conversation with me. Let's talk about it. But that's when we have to remind ourselves what the Bible says, that God will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. That he loves us despite whatever we're feeling. And that he will work out all things for our good. There are many times in scriptures that people, I mean, we see this in David, we see this in Joseph. Scott talked about Joseph and being God being with him and giving him favor and going before him. Um, Job, David, we talked about David in our homework. There's all these examples of how God is faithful despite circumstances. Despite our doubts, our lack of faith, God is still faithful. And this is why when we study women in the word and commune with the Father, and we get to know his heart and his plans, we can understand his way, right? We can't always trace God's hand, but we can always trust his heart. You know, he's a father. Um, I love this example one lady gave that was like a kid who's lost in a store, like all of a sudden realizes, oh my gosh, I don't know where I am, I'm lost. But the parent sees him the whole time and is watching him and says, hey, no, come here. Come, 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 you're okay. That's how our father is. We may feel lost, or we may look around and feel like, oh my gosh, I don't know where to go. But the father is so, so good. He always has his eye on us. He never, we never went anywhere where he didn't see. And that's what Job showed us too, right? That although he couldn't see everything, he knew God was there. He knew God's character. He knew God's heart. And so he decided to place that trust in him. What are the practical things? I want to talk a little bit about this because a lot of times we talk about, yes, choose faith over feelings and God's word, but what are some real things that we can do to get back to realigning ourselves with that? To get back to remembering God's character and strength and confidence like Paul and Silas did. 
We want to be able to be ready to be able to praise and sing when those things come. Well, first of all, I'm just going to say, stop picking up we already laid down at his feet. Yes? Yes. That anger, that fear, that unforgiveness that you already laid down, don't pick it up again. You know, Paul wouldn't be who Paul is today if he kept hanging on to, I'm a Pharisee, or, um, you know, I don't know, what I did was pretty bad. I don't think God could forgive me. Paul knew that God's word was true. He knew that he didn't have to pick that bag up because he was transformed. Jesus said, you are cleansed, you are forgiven. And he went to preach the gospel and tell everyone that and stand on that truth. Even though in his circumstances and what he, where he came from, his past, his history said everything otherwise. But how he changed and was different today made a difference. So ladies, can I just encourage you, don't pick up those bags anymore. And if you're carrying them, ask the God to help you drop it and don't carry it anymore. Just commit to letting go of the old way and say, God, show me a new way. So cast that off first. And then we all know worship. Jen and the team can get us right into worship, but another practical way is that whether you're in your car or you're at home, you're listening to the radio, um, Anything, if you just start singing, if you just start being in the presence of God and listening to the lyrics, even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I see it, I don't see it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. I'm not a good singer, so forgive me, but I can recite the words. And it changes the way you look at things. And it helps you. And can I just encourage you to find a song in your season? Whatever season you're going through, there is a song out there for you, and God will put it in your heart. And you can just hold on to that, put it on repeat, and it will change your thinking. It will change the way you're feeling. It will get you back to the word and back to hungering for God and just being and soaking in his presence. You know, worship is forgetting about what's wrong with you and remembering what's right with God. Forgetting about what's wrong with you, but remembering, worshiping what's right with God. Declarations. We've been practicing this for seven weeks. You can also actively do your declaration. So repeat after me. I am loved. I am, loved. I am redeemed. I am, redeemed. I, am I am victorious. Because of him. Because of him. And these are truths that we can say because we've studied them for seven lessons. But I want to encourage you to keep declaring it. Keep saying them over and over. Keep putting it into your DNA so that you will come. Every time that feeling of doubt comes up, you can say, nope, God will never forsake me. He will never abandon me. I will not be discouraged, but I will be encouraged. Speak to it. Declare it to it. You, I am the daughter of the King of Kings. You know what that means? I can walk into that throne room and ask for it, and I will receive it. You boldly ask for it. Declarations. So when doubt comes against us, we have to lift up our shield of faith. And that's the word of God. Yeah. When we open our mouth and proclaim it and say it, what God's word says, it changes our mind. It changes what we're seeing. And instead of grumbling and complaining and seeing the circumstances, again, we're glancing at our problem, but we're gazing upon God. And when we're in the word, we can speak to it. We can call it out. We can believe it. And the other thing we do is soap. A lot of you are familiar, we do the journaling at the end of each of the lessons. But I encourage you not just to soap, but really ask God, what is the scripture saying to me in this season? What are you saying, Lord, to me? What is that one word that I can take away? What does that mean in my life? Meditate on it. Pray on it. Pray it out loud. So. Lord, how can you come alongside me and help me to see this clearly? Meditate it. Put it on your mirror. Put it on your dashboard. Put it on your refrigerator so that when you go by, you see it. It's so important to get the word of God inside and then be reminded as we go through our really hurry, horrific, busy days. And then we see it and glance at it and we go, oh, yeah, the presence of God. And we can remind ourselves. I love the scripture that we had in our lesson. It's Deuteronomy 31.8. It 
And another thing we can do when we are studying this and we're meditating is personalize it. So I take, take this scripture, and Deuteronomy 31, eight, and I put my name in it. And you can put your name in it too. This is a great one to remember because it applies to so many things in our life. I say, Kate, don't be discouraged. Kate, the Lord goes ahead of you. Kate, the Lord is with you. Kate, he will never fail you. Kate, he will never abandon you. And we part, start to personalize what that scripture is because he did mean it for you. He does want you to see what it is that he's trying to tell you, how much he loves you, what, what, truth, what is truth and what is not truth. And we can only do that by getting the word in us and then personalizing it. Another way is to associate ourselves with other passionate Jesus believers. We do this at Women in the Word. When we're around other people who love Jesus, it helps us. In that season when you're dry, get an accountability partner, get a prayer partner, get a woman who's going to speak into your life that's going to say, you are loved, you are chosen, don't forget this, I love you. Associate yourself, and that's why I'm so glad we have women in the Word, because we can do that. We can come together at least just on a Tuesday night to be encouraging one another, to be speaking into one another. Acts 4.31 says, When they prayed, the whole place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the Word of God with boldness. And that's what we can do together. We can say it out loud. We can pray it out loud together. So surround yourself with like-minded people. It, it does matter who we're around. That negative Nelly will only make us negative. So turn it around, flip it on your head. Get yourself around people who are going to encourage you and speak life into you. The other thing we could do is read and listen. We can listen to uh, a streaming service. We can listen to an old Pastor Wayne CD. Some of you probably don't know what a CD is, but it's a compact disc. You can download it or watch it on YouTube. But when we start to feed ourselves, when you're reading, whether it's 15 minutes a day of a book of how it's going to make you better or someone's testimony, when we hear people that are talking about the fire of God, it also lights something else up in us and gives us fire. So we need to take responsibility for our growth as well as mature in reading the Bible, yes, but we can also supplement it with all these other God stories and people that are giving testimonies because that encourages us. We relate to it and the Spirit will speak through that as well. So these are practical things that we can do. But I want to say one of the things that we don't talk about so much is self-care. Why is it that we keep our promises to our boss, we keep our promises to our clients, we keep our promises to our family, to our kids, but we don't keep our promises to ourselves. We break them. We're, it's the first promise we break is ours because we need to do this or we need to go here or we need to do there. So we need to make self-care a priority. And if you haven't done that, schedule it. And some of the things you can do are taking solitude away from distractions, maybe unplugging 24 hours from Facebook or your phone. Maybe it's just 20 minutes of intentional moving around and getting your blood circulating and breathing and going outside and going, oh yeah, I live in Hawaii. Oh yeah, Lord, look at that. That is so beautiful. Look at that rainbow. Amazing. But self-care can be doing your devotions instead of going on your phone. It could be scheduling a massage or getting in your nails done. Or maybe you're not into that, but maybe you really enjoy a movie or coffee time. All these things are really important to take time for self-care. Because if we don't do it, no one else is going to do it. And God says, you are wonderfully and beautifully made. And he wants you to take care of your body. He wants you to take care of your soul. He wants you to make it a priority and intentionally schedule those things. So can I encourage you on this break to at least do one self-care thing? It doesn't have to be a big thing, but just really schedule something for yourself. That's just one day that you, en something you enjoy and you just go, thank you, God, this is awesome. And then as we go forward, we've learned all these great things, but if you don't put into consistent action, if you don't practice this, it's going to fall away. If you 
we know these things, but we don't do it, what good is it? We have to put it into consistent action. We have to, um, as John 13, 17 says, if you know these things, blessed are you who do them. God knows it's going to bless you if you do these different things. We talked about worship. We talked about meditation. We talked about word. We talked about fellowship. We talked about praise. So pick any of those, but pick self-care once this break that we have and put it into action because blessed are you who do them. So let's encourage one to keep another to keep going, keep growing. When we run into the problems and even in the pain, we're going to glance at the problems and we're going to gaze upon God. We're going to remember who God says we are. And no matter if you're having a good day or a bad day, or what people out there think, good or bad of you, I know what God says of me. I can stand on that truth. You are his child. You are chosen. You are beloved. He's commissioned you and equipped you. And trials will come and go, but God is forever. History will end, but eternity is forever. And we can put all our marbles into that basket. We'll get to be in the presence of God, love personified, and it's going to be glorious when we get there. So please enjoy the next three weeks off. We're going to be back on April 11th. Um, we're doing the Book of Colossians as our next study. And have a wonderful, happy Easter celebrating Jesus. Amen.